welcome everyone. Um, we are switching gears here and um, talking with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, we've got uh, we've got three folks here uh, with us to uh, to help us understand how the work of the council has evolved um, and. Uh, in order to set the context for that, I guess I'm going to invite John Gannon to uh, to help folks who were not on the committee last year um, get oriented to the changes that were made uh, to the council um, by acts of the legislature last year. So, John, go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, last year we worked on a bill, um, S124, which, among other things, um, modified. Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, the first thing it did is it ch changed its name. It, it used to be called the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council because one of its prime functions was training law enforcement officers. Um, however, it has other responsibilities um, and probably one of the ones we're most concerned about in the legislature um, is its um, importance in reviewing unprofessional conduct by law enforcement officers. Um, and hence the name change, because I think it, it captures better um, what the council um, currently does. Um, so another change um, was we changed the membership of the council. Um, uh, and among the changes were the majority of the council um, is now made up of non-law enforcement officers. So um, for example, um, the executive director, um, let's see, the executive director of racial equity is now on the council. Um, um, an employee of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, um, appointed by the executive director of the league is on the council. Um, uh, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Center for C Crime Victim Services is on the council. Um, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Human Rights Commission is now on the council. Um, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence um, is on the council. Um, the governor um, gets to appoint seven public members who, and I, I'm quoting now, who shall not be law enforcement officers or have a spouse, parent, child, or sibling who is a law enforcement officer current legislator or otherwise be employed in the criminal justice system. And of these seven members, at least one of the members shall be um, a mental health crisis worker. As you know, law enforcement officers are often the first to respond to people who are having a, a mental health crisis. Um, at least one of the members shall be an individual with lived experience of mental health conditions or psychiatric disability and at least two of the members shall be chosen from among persons nominated by the Vermont chapters of the NAACP. And each of these members shall represent a different um, chapter of the Vermont NAACP. Um, in addition to that, um, the governor is to appoint a chair from among the members who do not have a law enforcement connection. So this is a significant change because now the majority of the council are not law enforcement officers. Um, it, we also um, require that the council provide different training options for officers, including the requirement to provide for transition from level two to level three certification. So those are, are the most common two certifications for law enforcement officers in the state. Um, and uh, the council service, and this is a new addition is, in section nine of the bill, the council services are contingent on law enforcement agencies um, complying with requirements for collecting roadside data. Um, and I don't know if you all saw it, um, the Un University of Vermont just released um, uh, a new report on traffic stop data. And we still have many um, law enforcement agencies throughout the state not fully complying with the traffic stop data. So those agencies would not be able to use council services until they get into better compliance. Um, I think that covers most of the significant changes with respect to the council. Tanya Vyhovsky. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Rep Gannon, if they're not able to use council services, does that also mean the council won't review unprofessional conduct for those law enforcement agencies? I don't believe so. I, I believe what it does is they're not allowed to participate in the training programs that the council offers. So for example, if you have a new police officer that needs to receive level three, level three certification, um, that would be at the police academy. Um, which is part of the council's responsibility. So they would not be able to do their level three training. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members, um, especially those who weren't uh, in the government operations committee last year when we contemplated these changes? Sam Lefebvre. Rep. Gannon, was this what you were concerned about when we were talking yesterday, I believe, or the day before, that some of this would get all the work that you had done will go away if we're not careful with some of the executive order work? That's correct. Is that, this the board you were? Or, okay. Yes, and, and please call me John. Um, <laughs> you don't need to call me Rep. Gannon. Um, uh, so yes, if, if one of my concerns was with respect to the executive order is the continuing independence of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. All right, well, thank you, John, for that overview. And um, I very much appreciate the clarifying questions from committee members as well. And so I guess I would like to invite um, Bill Sorrell and Bill Sheets and Cindy Taylor Patch to uh, to share with us the reformation, reconfiguration of the Criminal Justice Council and um, a little bit of a status update on uh, what you've been up to. It's been a busy couple of months. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Bill Sheets. I'm the interim executive director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and Vermont uh, Police Academy. And those two are essentially interchanged, right? We're kind of all one uh, family. First and foremost, uh, prior to uh, coming here and filling in as the interim, I had a 30 year career in the Vermont State Police. And then I was happily living in the consulting world when my phone rang uh, on what I consider a great opportunity to come in here and work with uh, with a group of people that I had a tremendous amount of respect for before, but even more so now. Uh, I think first, I wanna say thank you. Uh, I don't think you hear it enough. Uh, S-124 comes with a lot of mandates for due. Uh, so thank you for that. I served uh, in my capacity with the state police on the council in its old format, 12 person format for a decade. Vice chair for four years. This is exactly how the the council should look the way it looks now. So you'll hear from Bill Sorrell uh, uh, in great detail coming in as the chair, but the onboarding process for the new people, in particular the new positions, specifically the seven governor appointees, it was tremendous having those conversations. People are here for the right reasons. We've only had two meetings but uh, we are full steam ahead in terms of taking a comprehensive look collaboratively toward everything in S-124, uh, the use of force bill, S-119, anything related to cannabis, highway safety. And the, the primary means, the concern was, is a 24 person council manageable when you also have staff and proxies? So, the meetings are averaging about 35 people in attendance. And the answer is, yeah, they're very manageable because we're gonna, we're gonna harness the power and the energy and the compassion of this group and through subcommittees. So yesterday was our second council meeting and we have assigned every single person uh, kind of an interwoven approach into subcommittees where they will now dive into the meaningful work that has to be done that's outlined in S-124 and elsewhere. So there are 10 of those right now. There are 10 either subcommittees or working groups, essentially following the approach uh, outlined in the legis legislative report that we sent to House and Senate Appropriations and GovOps. And I think uh, the first meeting of these groups has to occur by February 5th. 
Uh, I think we're going to make tremendous progress during this legislative session. I am glad that we're being held accountable by all of you. Uh, I do hope that we have conversations uh, and, and follow up related to the Criminal Justice Council. Uh, it, the council should remain an independent body. I think that is the intent behind the Agency of Public Safety. From a viewpoint of leadership, from where I sit, I do think it's critically important that this executive director's position, which uh, will be filled by the end of March, hopefully, reports to somebody, right? This position also needs to be held accountable. It deserves to be held accountable. So I think we're, the position itself and the cadre of staff here are gonna be held more accountable in that agency construct than the current mechanism, which essentially is the secretary of administration. And even that is loosely defined. So there have been a few hiccups here in leadership in the past decade. And I think those will largely be prevented by a, selecting the right candidate, most importantly, but the accountability factor that comes into uh, that agency of public safety. So I just wanted to open with an overview. I, I really wanna make sure we talk about Act 56 at some point. Uh, that to me is one of the most critical components, the professional regulation. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll defer to you. Should I jump into that now and continue or should, okay. Yes, please. So professional regulation is critically important. Uh, and it, it's not, and, and I know you understand it better than anybody as a committee, it's not designed to be an internal affairs component, right? The agencies are supposed to do that. We, the council, uh, and under this new construct that we have, uh, it's designed to hold the profession accountable. So uh, the steps that we've made, the immediate uh, inclusion of a five person subset of the 24 person council into a subcommittee for professional regulation. Before, as you recall, the language essentially fell on this executive director's position to receive either category A, B, or internally category C, complaints from the field, from the public, however, however they came in. And essentially with uh, it was almost the sole responsibility of this position. And with counsel, with, led, with counsel from the attorney generals, in, in our case now, uh, a very part-time role for, uh, for our uh, appointed counsel. Now the concept's gonna be these cases come in and I'll talk about the depth and the impact with us and, and how honestly we need your help. Uh, we need your help to do this better and to do this better, we need the resources to do this better. Uh, we can do it, but we can't do it as quickly and effectively as, as we should be. So a case will come in now. So say for example, uh, without naming names, but we have 29 current cases in the queue in various forms. Now, nine of those are things that made the paper, category A's, where officers in Vermont over the past, since July of 2018, when Act 56 went into play, uh, have been arrested, charged with crimes, and those cases have not yet been adjudicated, so they haven't been heard by the full council. One of the primary things that I, that I really love about Act 56 is in the past, for any case where an officer might have said, you know what, uh, I'm gonna resign, I'm gonna move on, maybe even when the, cases, the case was dropped criminally, and then they would look for employment downstream three, four, five years with another law enforcement agency. That's not good enough. Vermonters deserve better, the profession deserves better. Now we're gonna make a concerted effort in each and every one of those cases to bring it to the full council for a hearing and ultimately hold officers accountable and decertify them because there are people more than there should be that uh, <clears throat> need to be decertified. They shouldn't be operating as law enforcement in the state of Vermont. So under the current format, a case would come in for review. It would come directly to me. I would work with our legal counsel, but more importantly, the five person professional regulation subcommittee that truly has both sworn and civilian members to include governor appointees that will look at each and every case 
And then there's three options, right? But I don't make it on my own or whomever's sitting here doesn't make it on, my, on their own. Option A is it simply doesn't meet the criteria. It was a complaint, uh, six people plus the attorney look at it and decide collectively it needs to be essentially remanded back to the agency for whatever punitive punishment or corrective action they're gonna take. The second option is a category B first offense, which we have to make sure that we're tracking here weighing up the privacy rights uh, and due process rights of the individual officer while holding them accountable. By statutory language, category B first offenses do not get forwarded to the full council, but we have to do a really good job of making sure securely here we have a good record in either an access database, an Excel, an Excel database, whatever format that we ultimately decide on so that we can determine future second offenses. And then, any category A, any category B second offense, any category C, which is essentially a rules violation, need to go immediately through this committee up to the full council. I just wanna give you an example. So there was one, even though we just review, we do not have internally the capacity or the capability to handle these in the manner that we should. There's no professional regulation investigator position. Uh, candidly, there's no one trained to that degree. Capacity uh, is very thin on who we have here. While it's a tremendous staff, gifted staff, we just don't have the current capacity to, to handle these Act 56 cases. So we did a review of one, again, without naming names, that was remanded to us from the Attorney General's after a review where the Attorney General rightfully said, you know, although criminal charges might not apply in this case, I think it should be reviewed by the Criminal Justice Council. We have an investigator doing that right now, uh, Leslie Bodet, who is a training coordinator. But because we don't have the capacity, we assigned it to her. She's not done the report yet. We're 100 hours into that because we have to do these right. We have to make sure there's so much at stake, we gotta get it right. So when we do bring it to the council, Right, essentially we're providing uh, the, the investigative background for the prosecution of that officer. So times that, times the 29 that we have in the queue and we need help. Uh, I, I hope that we can demonstrate uh, through testimony uh, from multiple fronts that we critically need a staff attorney. Uh, right now the part-time attorney just does not have the capacity in their schedule. And I think that's outlined fairly articulately in the, uh, in the legislative report. We need a professional regulator. And then I think importantly, we need somebody that's a kind of a program technician that can make sure that everything is being funneled in the right way. And then additionally have the responsibility of kind of tying in everything the council stands for now. So we need to ensure that all the meaningful work that's happening in subcommittees doesn't get lost. So somebody that can be a center spoke that makes sure that it's coming in, the meaningful work's not getting lost, it's get, getting reported to the full council, but more importantly, it's being acted on, right? There's a lot of ask in 124 and they're all over the place and they're all an opportunity and we should look at each and every one of them and give them the due, uh, due regard, but the biggest threat in my personal opinion after being here only three months is our capability, capacity uh, to currently handle the way that they should be handled, those Act, Act 56 professional regulation complaints. And then I think, uh, you know, if time allows, I'm, I'm going to defer uh, unless there are questions now uh, and I see hands up. So I think, uh, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you. Uh, yes, Rob LeClaire has a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sheets. Um, of, of the 29, I guess you'd say, cases that you have out there, do all 29 of them find their way to that subcommittee? And does the subcommittee then sort of do a, a cursory look walk through of the case and then make the determinations from there. What I'm trying to drill down to is, you know, the case that you referred to where you've got upwards of a hundred hours. Um, 
do all 29 of those represent that amount of time and effort? No, I think they all vary in time, but yeah, I think that's the important uh, part here is that yes, each and every one of these will go to this new professional regulation subcommittee starting as early as next week. Again, it was just constituted. Chris, Bur Chris Burkell is going to be the chair of that uh, subcommittee. Uh, there are some that will probably take longer than that investiga investigatory wise. Hmm. So a lot of these are going to be review. So we, man, we ensure that an agency is doing a valid investigation, right? We want to make sure they're getting it right. So there are some agencies that are large enough to do a really good job at their internal affairs investigations. There are others, honestly, that we get the report and we say it's not good enough and we send it back. We internally here have to do the full investigation if it is an agency head and the full investigation if it's any category C. The rest fall on the agencies and are just review. So it's a, it's a long way of answering that instead of just a single person with a part-time attorney determining what should be moved forward, we're going to harness the power of the subcommittee. They're going to review every single case. In the case of the 100-hour investigation, uh, that person, our, our training coordinator, will be present to provide any, uh, answer any questions the subcommittee might have but it's condensed right now in, in what I believe is about a 25-page report mm -hmm. that will go to that subcommittee. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Lefebvre. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sheets, do we know who all the members on that subcommittee are? I said you, you said that uh, Chris was the chair. Do you know who the other members are? I do. And I can I can certainly send a uh, a roster after, but if you just allow me a second, I want to make sure I get it right. So Sean Pratt is a governor appointee. Uh, he represents the Rutland chapter of the NAACP. He is a uh, member. Trevor Whipple representing the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Morning Fox who is the Deputy Commissioner of the uh, Department of Mental Health. Heather Simons, who represents the Vermont Department of Corrections. Great. We would love to have um, the roster of subcommittees. When you have a moment, we'll post those on the committee page. Uh, Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Sheets, how are cases reported to the council? Is it any complaint or do they always come through the AG's office after adjudication? Uh, no, so that was a case that was referred for criminal review. So if it is a category A, those go to any number of either the attorney generals or the state's attorneys. There are only nine of those. The rest typically come directly to me uh, once the valid investigation uh, is completed, we get details. They're required within 10 days. So this is any of the law enforcement agencies in the state of Vermont of forwarding to us notification of an Act 56. That simply triggers a placeholder for us that says they're gonna do a valid investigation. Upon completion of the investigation, they must give us all of the documentation that supports that investigation. That is also why there's always going to be a bit of a lag time. Some of those take a long time. Then we will bring it to the professional regulation subcommittee and then determine through that body whether or not it goes to the full council. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, uh, and Bill, thank you for testifying today. Um, Going back to the staff attorney position that you, you reference and, and the, the need for that position, um, is that an immediate need? Um, yeah, I, I would suggest it's an immediate need. And I, and I should back up because I wasn't involved in the testimony last year. Honestly, if it was decided that the professional regulation aspect for this should live somewhere else, I don't know that anybody is truly opposed to that. I think it's a, the best fit here, right? We're the body that certifies the 
the 1800 law enforcement officers and we should be the body that decertifies, uh, I think is an immediate critical need because we don't have the expertise to navigate this. And there are other things that come in, for example, from other attorneys at the same time representation is aware that there's an Act 56. We also, we often get an accompanying letter, uh, just things that, right, um, I'm not a lawyer, I, I, I'm not qualified to be one, uh, and it's, it's confusing. It, this, when they called me about this job, uh, they conveniently left out all of the Act 56 impact. And, and <laughs> literally, it is, it is crushing us. The, the time is just crushing us. And again, y you all put a lot of time in S-124. Uh, Vermonters, our citizens, our police, we got to get this right. There's a lot at stake here. Thank you. I mean, um, just so you know, I'll be in House Appropriations um, this afternoon. Um, hearing from public safety about their Budget Adjustment Act needs. Um, and, you know, I, that's why I asked the question. I mean, if this is a need that needs to be funded in this fiscal year. Yeah, and it's a great question. And in, in fairness, we, as a council under, you know, no, we're not aligned with the Agency of Public Safety yet. We did not ask for a budget adjustment this year, just so you're aware. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great presentation. My question goes back to a, uh, a sort of sequential um, example you gave where you went through a disciplinary, investigatory, then disciplinary, then concluded, and I'm paraphrasing now, this person should not be a member of any law enforcement agency in the state of Vermont. It's in the state of Vermont that I wanted to focus on. My understanding was while uh, exercising uh, prudence in the area of personal, um, how would you say, deference to privacy rights, still, uh, that person could not move across state lines without the potential hire or employer knowing that that was the result in Vermont. Am I correct about that? Uh, I, I think we have less ability to control what happens outside our borders, but the other function of legislative impact that's positive, very positive, is Act 166 that went into effect October 1st of this year mandates that any higher ag agency in Vermont, whether or not that person comes from in-state or out-of-state, must have that candidate sign a waiver. So if Officer A leaves an agency and goes to uh, Agency B, they have to sign a waiver. That kind of indemnifies, right? The threat was always, what can you disclose and what can't you disclose? That leg legislation says you must. That has been a great tool because that hopefully will, will keep the, uh, I don't even want to say bad apples because now we're talking about people that haven't been decertified. That's easy. That's, that's public facing. If you get decertified, we think that's going to be uh, basically to the point where we're going to announce to the world and it's a public forum and a hearing that they're decertified. It's the other ones that don't reach that level that we're even concerned about. To your example, say it's a, a candidate that's coming here that worked in a law enforcement agency in New Hampshire or Massachusetts or any neighboring state. They are not uh, compelled to necessarily release based on our, K our legislative Act 166. If they don't, it should be a flag for hiring agencies. But, you know, that's the other positive thing. I don't hear any law enforcement agency saying we want to be less professional. Everybody's behind this. It's just, again, it's, it's a capacity and capability thing at this point. And, and honestly, it's why there's, there's a backlog that there is. Okay, thanks. That's very reassuring. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, are these council positions paid positions or are they volunteer positions? No, they're 100% volunteer and I, they are eligible uh, if they're not working for their agency. So say, for example, you work for a state agency and as part of your job duties you're attending, obviously you would get qualify for no compensation. The others actually do qualify for $50 a day if they choose to submit for it. That's when they're not a day. That is when there's a council meeting, let me clarify, or some other subcommittee meeting. Thank you. Hal Colston. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sheets, for your service to the Criminal Justice Council and the Police Academy. When we were working through this bill, um, there was some pushback about having a, a citizen um, chair of the council. So I'm, I, I'm just curious to know, how's that working out? Uh, it's working out outstanding and it's exactly what it should be. Uh, and, and the expansion of this is exactly what it should be. Look, at, it's threatening to some people. Change is threatening. Good. We, we should. Again, this is, I, I can't just say enough in, in praise and thanks for this because uh, we're having, Bill Sorrell and I as the chair, and I know I, I want to make sure he gets some time here. Uh, we are spending hours and hours on the phone each day and working together, but it's the outreach to the community members, in particular, those governor appointees that are here for all the right reasons. And you know what? They're going to hold us accountable. And that is part of it. And I have heard no one in any way, shape, or form from any organization say, you know, uh, I don't like the way that this is going. We're ensuring that these subcommittees include chairs and or vice chairs that represent the 12 new members, in particular, the publicly appointed members. Some might think that it's a concern that part of this professional regulation subcommittee includes a citizen appointee representing the Rutland chapter at the NAACP. I say that's ridiculous. It's what we need. It's, it's, it's how we should be doing business. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other committee questions. So we'll go back to, to you. And um, if you are gonna turn things over to Bill Sorrell or Cindy Taylor Patch at any point, we'll welcome them to introduce themselves as well. Yeah, I would like to turn it over to Bill Sorrell before I do, because and we may run out of time. Uh, Cindy Taylor Patch is our director of training, long standing person here. She is the one that runs this show, folks. She is tremendous in every single way. So I hope that we do get a chance to hear from her because uh, just absolutely tremendous for sure. But I'll I hope we do to too. Be, I hope we do too, Cindy. And I and before we go to Bill, I want to just give you a. a a moment of thanks for all of the flexibility and nimbleness uh, that, that you have had to exercise this year, um, keeping things going during COVID in very challenging times. So uh, thank, thank you. you for all that. And I hope we get a chance to, to hear from you um, uh, on this as well as uh, how, how the training has gone during COVID. Okay. Thank you. Bill Sorrell, thank you for being with us this morning. We may get to you sooner rather than later, Cindy. It looks like maybe Bill is uh, either having trouble unmuting or maybe stepped away for a moment. Um, so can you give us uh, a little status report on um, on all of the changes that you've had to make to training this year in order to accommodate the COVID uh, safety protocols? Sure, really quickly on that, um, I think everybody's aware of the, the quarantined academy that we had to do last year. So we actually had staff and a number of folks from BSP and uh, Wilmington PD and Colchester PD that all uh, lived here in quarantine at the academy with us not leaving the grounds for several weeks so that we could get a class through basic training and to their certification. And then uh, you know, we finished that and came back with a COVID mitigation plan for the class that's just recently graduated and had to make a number of changes. Uh, the facility could only safely hold a certain number of students. And luckily we were able to meet all agencies needs. So we didn't have to deny anyone, which was really great because we you know, don't want to be in the position of having to do that. But um, everybody has to have their own individual bedroom. So uh, for people that come to take in-service classes who want to stay overnight, uh, for the most part, we had to say, um, we can't do that right now because we have to have the recruit class all in separate rooms. 
Uh, we had to remove move the class from our classroom space into our gymnasium space uh, to allow for physical distancing of everyone um, in that learning space and to give the instructors plenty of space. Um, you know, recruits are masked all day, every day. They have very strict uh, cleaning and hygiene protocols. Uh, our food service delivery process had to entirely change. So we used to, if anybody's been here and seen it, we've had a, you know, buffet and a salad bar and things like that. And people serve themselves and we had to completely change that. So um, not any part of the day that wasn't impacted by COVID mitigation. And um, as you probably all are aware from the media coverage uh, that we had a COVID outbreak here anyway, <laughs> despite all those precautions and you know daily precautions and restrictions even on what recruits were doing on the mm -hmm. weekends. You know, we had them sign an agreement um, that they would restrict uh, their behavior on the weekends as well. Uh, but thankfully, um, none of the recruits were very ill. Uh, we quickly shifted to an online training environment as much as we could. Um, you know, a lot of our training isn't completely conducive to an online model, but we took what we could and um, kept them busy for a couple of weeks uh, while everyone was getting tested and in, in recovery and, and then got everyone back and graduated uh, the entire class. So um, it's been a lot of hiccups and a tough, uh, tough road to hoe, but it's um, everybody was able to get through it and, and thankfully no need for, you know, hospitalization or any significant medical treatment. So we're pretty happy about that, uh, but certainly has been a lot of changes and uh, limited what we can do here at the facility. So everyone's trying to be creative, uh, trying to constantly be on top of making sure that, you know, people are getting health screen screenings constantly. Uh, I'm working with our partners to try to do some regional training still, but you know, there's a lot of limitation on who wants people um, in their buildings. So uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of work and communication with all of our law enforcement agency partners around the state. Thanks, Cindy. I really appreciate that update, and um, thank you again for uh, for going above and beyond um, and and trying to make uh, make this work throughout a pandemic. Um, committee members, any specific questions for Cindy before we go to Bill Sorrell? I know too, just real quick, I know there's a number of you that I haven't met before. So just to give you a sense of who I am, um, as Director Sheets said, I've been here um, going on almost 20 years. And uh, prior to my career here, I was a mental health crisis worker. So I'm, I'm a civilian employee that's in charge of basic training and all the personnel who run it, um, not a sworn law enforcement officer and uh, worked doing uh, crisis mental health response uh, based both inpatient and out in the community. And was a case manager for children and families for Rutland Mental Health for a number of years. And I teach uh, primarily on social issues, uh, mental health crisis response, uh, how to conduct a compassionate death notification, uh, you know, diversity issues and all that sort of thing. Substance use issues um, are very important to me as well. So just uh, for those of you who I haven't met before uh, that you know uh, where I'm coming from. So um, nice to see you all. Hope to be in person uh, sometime in the not too distant future. Ideally, uh, John Gannon has a question. Thank you, um, and thank you for testifying today, Cindy. Um, quick question on an appropriations related question. Um, I, I know that public safety is requesting $450,000 uh, for S-119 training um, and um, for Vermont State Police and $1.4 million for municipal law enforcement. Um, in the Budget Adjustment Act, but um, there doesn't appear to be any training request coming from the, the council. Um, so I think um, Executive Director Sheets can speak more specifically to what he's requested on that. But yeah, the, the training that would be mandated under the law certainly does have a significant impact um, on our training budget. And um, I can certainly turn that over to him to answer that more specifically. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that uh, the funding request is essentially to identify a mechanism to fund the training, but we would be a key critical part in the delivery of that, whether that's space, expertise, 
And that is going to be a heavy lift because I don't know exactly, we don't know exactly what that looks like yet. And that's the struggle in a COVID environment. We, uh, we have to be mindful of continuing to do the training and certification of those level twos. Those are the, the roughly 200, 200 hour trainees that can do all but nine things that the 800 hour trained people can. And still in a COVID world, we're going to roll out a full-time basic, the 16 week starting in uh, the April, May timeframe. So it's how to do all of that and roll it out. But that's why there's not a particular line item. And coming from the state police budget world for 10 years into this, right? Our budget's not complex uh, in its current format. And 92% of our budget goes to fee for space, uh, pay, you know, paying the rent essentially, uh, food services and salary benefits. And it's, you know, it's a, we're about $2.6 million. So uh, we're, we're pretty tiny. In the use of force training area, I will say, um, you know, it requires a lot of practice to be a good instructor. And you have to be extremely intelligent to navigate the, the legal complexities, to be able to teach it well to others. But it also the physical techniques require a lot of practice. So it's a pretty heavy demand on any of our staff that do get involved in that. Um, and also since um, the council passed a rule, administrative rule requiring every officer in the state have four hours of use of force training every year, um, in order to keep their skills fresh um, in case they do need to use them, that they should be doing them correctly. And that requires practice. Uh, we get a lot of requests for support on that four hours of training. And just, you know, because of our staffing, it is challenging for us to be able to help. Um, mo most agencies do have an in-house instructor, but uh, we help them as much as we can, but not as much as we'd like to because of our staffing. Thank you. Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, forgive me just being trying to get up to speed here, but I, I hear that there's a four hour yearly use of force training. What if any training requirement on a yearly basis is there for de-escalation? Yeah, there's, there's not on de-escalation uh, specifically. Sometimes that can be a part of an ongoing uh, use of force training requirement. Um, instructors can include that from our curriculum in theirs, but it, right now that's up to them. Uh, the council doesn't mandate what the content of that four hours is. Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you very much um, uh, for her being a 20 year veteran of the training uh, regime. I, 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 I hope it's okay. I just wanted to remind uh, the veterans on government ops two years ago, I was in with two chiefs of police uh, with a bill that proposed to have uh, a mental health crisis worker uh, partner uh, with the local PDs. I've reintroduced that uh, instead of just a pilot for Barry and Montpelier, which was two years ago, H45 uh, essentially offers that opportunity to any uh, qualified municipality with a state funding partnership. I, I really do, following on Tanya's question, I really do think uh, uh, contemplating crisis intervention or some sort of uh, familiarity with uh, mental health crisis work and their strategies would be extremely helpful if that bill gets legs, which it seems to be it, its time may have come since mental health workers are now stationed in all the SP uh, barracks. I, I, I suspect that this is a comer uh, and it would be useful uh, to have that as part of ordinary municipal training. Thanks. Yeah, I can speak real quickly to that because I know uh, Chair Sorrell needs some time, but real quickly on that. So one of the things that we do, and we've been doing for quite a while is um, a an, an basic level of awareness for new officers in mental health response. Uh, so all the recruits get that and any level two officer is also required uh, to take that course. And then um, there's also a program out there that you're probably aware of or, or will hear about um, soon is the team two training. So Kristen Chandler and I uh, work pretty closely together in that sort of a secondary uh, level of crisis response collaboration between law enforcement and mental health. And then um, we're also strategizing now that team two has been out there for a while, uh, some additional level of training whether it's you know, new content or some refresher concepts of what we can do going forward. Um, hopefully once things get a little 
more stable here with our staffing and we get our new executive director in place and our committees up and running and all that work kind of moving forward that we'll be able to launch that sort of third tier. Couldn't agree with you more. Thanks, Cindy. And welcome, Bill Sorrell. Thank you for being <laughs> with us this morning. Well, uh, thank you. I apologize for the technological glitch. I think I'm more experienced with Microsoft Teams than Zoom, but uh, I finally hit the right buttons. Um, I, I just want to underscore the expression of gratitude to the legislature for S-124. Um, there's an awful lot in there, but it's hugely important stuff. I thought I would spend just a couple of minutes saying how I became chair. I, the truth of the matter is when I got that first call, I uh, got two calls on a day in late October from uh, Commissioner Sherling and then later in the day from Jay Persing Johnson, the governor's legal counsel, uh, asking me if I would be willing to consider becoming the chair of this newly created council. And I, uh, in truth, had not heard anything about S-124 and, uh, uh, but I took a request from folks I like and respect uh, like that. And they, they indicated they were calling on behalf of the governor. And so I embarked on several weeks of due diligence, uh, not only reading the statute carefully, typing up three or four pages of questions for Jay Johnson about what does this mean? What exactly are the powers? And this, this and that, talk with folks in law enforcement, out of law enforcement. I called and spoke to Senator White because I knew it came out of her committee as to really what was the legislature trying to accomplish here. And I asked some of the law enforcement folks I reached out to How's law enforcement feeling about this new council? Is it uh, a feeling that the legislature is kind of messing in our business or your business and, and uh, you, you know, is, is this just a political thing? And uh, it was a couple of folks that even I don't know well, but I are perceived to be progressive law enforcement leaders in the state. And they, they expressed how much they were looking forward to the operations of this council and the broadening of the voices, uh, looking at not only police training, but the importance of taking a hard look at the front end ed stuff of what kind of candidates should be admitted to the academy to become law enforcement officers in the state. And, and one of the priorities for the the council, of course, will be the professional regulation subcommittee. That was the, we asked the council members to express their top three preferences for what subcommittees they'd be on. And professional regulation was by far the most popular committee or the one that the most people expressed the preference for. But others said, we got to really look at the personality tests that people take before they come into the council. Uh, we've got to take a hard look at various issues in, in the curriculum of the training. There was a question about uh, de-escalation. Well, clearly, uh, I think that the legislature in not only adding the commissioner of mental health uh, a representative of, uh, of uh, an organization that deals with those with mental health uh, challenges, a requirement that one of the governor's appointees have a history of uh, dealing with mental health challenges that de-escalation and police officers in responding to situations involving an individual or individuals who have had or are having mental health uh, uh, episodes or uh, their, their, their behaviors are impacted uh, by these things. Uh, law enforcement officers got to be better trained uh, to deal with these situations. Just a few of the, the priorities uh, 
uh, for us. So I, uh, after doing all the due diligence, I asked to have a virtual meeting with the governor because I really wanted to ask him, uh, what are you really trying to accomplish by this? You signed the bill, uh, what do you want out of it? And his answers were the last thing I really needed to know. And, and so in that call, which was a week or so before Thanksgiving, I said, after he gave his answers to my questions, I said, well, I was flattered to be asked to, uh, to consider doing this. And if you still want me, I'd be honored to serve. And truth is, uh, I haven't put in for the $55 <laughs> a day, but I've worked the vast majority of days, uh, including sometime on weekends since uh, late October and uh, right up through, uh, we got a whole bunch of calls and meetings in, in the week ahead and then we got two days set aside for executive director uh, uh, interviews, subcommittee meetings, on and on. I, so I, I, I reached out personally to all of the governor's appointees before uh, they, uh, we had our first meeting. And uh, I was so impressed by the appreciation they expressed for having been chosen and appointed by the governor to serve. And secondarily, their in enthusiasm, the recognition of the importance of what this council is being asked to do and their enthusiasm to, uh, to get to work. So it's kind of feeding on itself. Uh, I'm gonna hate to see uh, Bill Sheets re return to <laughs> his life before uh, his acting capacity because he, he's a star and we are gonna do our damnedest to have an executive director who's gonna come close to being a Bill Sheets uh, with personality, uh, experience, uh, respect for law enforcement and respect for the community needs that law enforcement has to serve. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to serve as chair. I spent five years as administration secretary. So I spent a lot of time in GovOps committees and appropriations committees and on and on and on. And then uh, didn't get so much in GovOps when in my almost 20 years as attorney general, but uh, occasionally and uh, my, my mother was, uh, when I was younger, spent 10 years in the Senate representing Chittenden County. I was the only woman in the Senate for one or two of her terms. So I've always had a lot of respect for the uh, legislative branch. I look forward to working with you uh, going forward. Thanks, Bill, and uh, welcome to you in your new role. Um, this has been uh, 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 an area of focus for this committee, um, I think in large part because our communities, our constituents are asking us to look at ways to change uh, the way law enforcement interacts with civilians. Um, we've talked a little bit during this uh, hearing this morning about, um, about law enforcement interactions with people in mental health crisis, uh, but we also touched very briefly on the data reporting uh, short, shortfalls um, that we think are really necessary in order to get a better handle on where implicit bias uh, exists in law enforcement. And so I'm hoping that you can speak to that for a moment. Well, I, I alluded to it slightly with the, the front end stuff of the, the council, among other responsibilities, is going to approve the uh, pre-academy testing for uh, potential recruits and to uh, try to have the status as the state of the science improves in these kinds of tests, discerning some of the personality traits that can be masked, but when they rear their ugly heads uh, can be unfortunate. And if you're given the power of being a law enforcement officer and you harbor some of those personality traits, uh, it could be terribly 
ugly. And so the, 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 the front end issues, the, the quality, personality, integrity traits of the recruits coming into law enforcement, then taking a hard look at the curriculum, including de-escalation and the importance of that, every bit as important as when it's appropriate to use deadly force. Uh, and then a streamlined, inclusive backend process when officers from departments large and small are accused of professional misconduct. This council will be a repository of those reports and will have the authority to take another look at what discipline, if any, but any has been imposed at the local level and, <clears throat> and to revisit that, that discipline, those decisions, if the council deems it, uh, deems it important to do so. And so front end, mid course, back end response to uh, unfortunate uh, conduct. And with us being a repository of those records, knowing the allegations of professional misconduct and getting away from a situation where it's maybe an office a department doesn't have a bad officer, but they have one who's not as good as they particularly want. And so that officer quietly moves to another department and maybe that department doesn't know adequately what the service history of this or that officer uh, can't you know is all about and so the provision of having them have to waive everything that's in the the personnel file and you know in a settlement of a disciplinary case where part of the settlement is this letter will be removed or not disclosed or something like that uh, there's no such thing as a perfect mousetrap, but this statutory configuration, the authorities of the council are going to be steps uh, going forward to try to make those loopholes smaller and smaller and smaller. And just one final point on that is I think one of the great things about S124 is that various of these policies, like on use of body cameras, uh, where to take a look at facial recognition, if that becomes more prevalent in law enforcement. Uh, there, are, there are some other things. But the, I think what the legislature is thinking is that, and this was a frustration for me as attorney general, I could suggest that these are those policies for use of tasers and reporting use of tasers be adopted but I didn't have the authority to, uh, to order it. And I think what the legislature's thinking is that these policies in these areas like body-worn cameras are gonna be for statewide application and enforcement. And so uh, uh, police department X isn't gonna be able to say, ah, that's Montpelier stuff and we do things differently here in our neck of the woods or whatever. Fundamentally, Vermonters and those in Vermont who interact with law enforcement can have very, very different experiences depending where they get stopped and or by whom. I mean, state police is a big organization. And I don't mean to call out this sergeant who has resigned, but who allegedly posted some ugly stuff online uh, after on January 6th or thereabouts. And I don't think there are many people who would think that an, unco uh, uh, an off color operator or occupants of a car that gets stopped by a trooper who harbors certain sentiments like that is gonna be uh, treated in quite the same way as folks who were stopped by Bill Sheets when he was just uh, a highway trooper. 
And we've got to do a better job on this. And um, we got a lot to do. Thanks, Bill. Cindy. Just wanted to say really quickly an update for folks specific to your question about race data collection. So we have a grant uh, through the Office of Highway Safety that's specifically focused on race data collection, where we're going to be able to look specifically at what some of the data issues are, where people are not reporting, and then uh, coordinate very specific targeted um, remedial training if needed, um, trying to get to the bottom of what the issues with the race data reporting are and to train people accordingly. So those um, that's currently um, about to be in the RFP process and will be active and in place this year. And, and uh, the council will not be reluctant to exercise its authority to require individual law enforcement entities that haven't complied with these obligations, they will, they will lose access to many of the things they need to run a professional police force. Thanks, Bill. Tanya Vihovsky. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll try to, to limit it. Um, so one of my questions is what specific data is collected? I know that we have race data that we're collecting, and I imagine that some of the challenges we see in disproportionate um, police involvement also spans the scope of income, house, whether or not someone is housed or not. So I, I, I'm wondering what specific data we are collecting and if there's a repeated pattern of non-compliance with collecting of data at what point or if it ever rises to the level of being sanctioned. I'm worried about police losing access to being able to run a professional police force and how that might in and of itself negatively impact our communities. Who wants to answer that? Uh, I'd be happy to answer it. So I was uh, the chair of our uh, Bias Street Policing Committee for 10 years, worked very closely during that time with many people to include uh, Dr. Stephanie Seguino, and was involved in the inception of what was collected at Roadside. So essentially, and I apologize for the banging, they're actually working on the pipes in the basement right below my office. So if you hear that, uh, all is okay. Uh, essentially, it's it's related directly to traffic stops. So the first one is the reason for the stop. So whether it be speeding, a defective equipment, somebody uh, had called in and said, you know, this person's all over the road driving drunk. There's certain criteria. Those criteria are restricted. Then it is the race of the operator based on the perception of the officer, right? So it, you, you don't ask that question, you simply, and then there are a few other data points that are collected, essentially uh, the outcome of the stop, whether you give a ticket, whether you give a warning, whether there's an arrest, for example. And I can send you exact a back copy of uh, a police department's form. And then really where it truly ties in, whether or not there was a search conducted, right? So that then ties into the race of the operator and the operator only based on the perception of the officer. And the last piece was, was there contraband found? So were there drug seized? Was there stolen property, et cetera, et cetera. And the highlight, uh, you know, and, and again, I don't know that I'm hearing from anybody that they don't want to get this right. And people need to know that they need to be better. Any agency that tells you that uh, they're perfect and they can't improve, mm, let's just leave it at that, right? They got some things to work on. Uh, but that traffic stop data, I think, is just, it should be looked at uh, collaboratively. And it should be a basis for discussion because everybody has biases. And I'm fortunate enough that in the three years spanning my career with the state police, I got to travel around the US and Canada as a consultant in behavioral science-based leadership, focusing on things like culture and bias and, and a number of other things over what is a three-week course. and. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can have just two minutes to kind of, I just, I, I love this topic. And I think we uh, collectively, based on your work, uh, we can start to identify trying to get people in here uh, on the front end that are better prepared for this career. So it starts with the selection of a good candidate, right? We can help with that while making sure that our test 
uh, doesn't have those biases or as little as possible, that it's contemporary, that it doesn't have a sex or racial bias, the psychological profile. But the recipe for a great police officer is not a secret. It's not like the Coke recipe or KFC, right? It should be shared with all. It is somebody that is always going to be polite, professional, whose moral compass points true north, that has empathy and compassion. And the tough part is the correct balance of IQ and EQ, emotional intelligence in a law enforcement career and the ability to communicate effectively is vastly as important, if not more important than your IQ. And if you can package those things up to all together, uh, when they leave here, uh, they're going to be in good shape. Then you got to work a little bit more on ensuring that there's a consistent socialization process and culture in place in the organizations they go to. And, and if we can do a better job collectively at all of that, we will raise the level of professionalism in Vermont law enforcement. And when I say that, please, I go all over the U.S. and Canada. Vermont gets it more right than anywhere I've ever been. And the fact that we have a single point of training where all officers go through, I think is probably the most, uh, the biggest reason for that. You know, Vermont, one-stop shop. We're all on the same page. We can do meaningful, impactful training. The state of Ohio, 64 places to go for law enforcement training. So there's a wide range. We're one of only four or five states where all state, county, and local law enforcement go through one training session. With all that being said, I think we're great. We do it well. Can we get better? Of course we can. And I, and I think we, we truly, I know it sounds like a cheesy appeal, but we need your help to make sure we're doing everything we can to bring that profession to the next level. Thank you. I would really love to see that form that you talked about. And I wonder, just as a bit of a follow-up, if there is any openness to an expansion of the data required. Some of the things that came up for me as you were talking were age, um, perceived gender and what neighborhoods are stops happening in? Are there particularly concentrated areas where more stops are happening, which would indicate that perhaps people are spending more time, the officers are spending more time there, why? And so I think there's a lot of information that we could gather, not necessarily roadside, but that we really do need to really examine the bias that we all do have. Yeah, I can send you, so I'll send you both copies of uh, a, a traffic ticket. So all of the criteria you, ex you talked about that's on the front side of the ticket. So that is data that can be measured and can be examined. It, you know, I think what you'll hear is there's not often a, a true agreement on the methodology for the examination of that data. That, and, and I'm not an expert in that area, but uh, by the end of today, you will have a front and back of a ticket as well as the roster, a, a draft of the roster subcommittees that we have so far. Great, if you could send those to our committee assistant so she can post them um, on the committee page in case anyone's following along from the public and would like to access those. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mark Higley. Thank you. Uh, this is a question I know even years ago, it was getting to be a struggle to find qualified candidates. And I know the screening process uh, years back also filtered out a lot. Um, and it, maybe it's too early to tell, but um, are, are you finding that it's, it's getting harder and harder to get applicants to even apply? I can't speak on behalf of the respective organizations, but I can share with you uh, the conversations are that it is getting more difficult and it's an onerous process, right? This, uh, this career is a calling and it was, but I still think that that process is in place for a reason and the selection process is still very stringent. I do think you're seeing a, a drop. I wouldn't call it a precipitous drop, but a drop nationally on number of applicants. That's true here in Vermont as well. Uh, and I think uh, the good part is the 22 recruits that just graduated from here after 16 weeks looking out at them it's 22 folks that certainly appear at this point in their career to be here for the right reasons, for all the right reasons, for that noble cause, that, that it's a career, it's a calling. It's, if you take that formula that I talked about where you have that empathy and compassion, you're polite, professional, and you do it the right way, you're going to have an impact. And that's why people are getting into law enforcement. If you have an impact on people, uh, you can be transformational in ways that might not be apparent every day, every month, but you will make an impact in a positive way on people's lives. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Tanya, go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. In terms of the authority of the council, does the authority have the council to mandate disciplinary action? And if so, what kind of disciplinary action or do they simply make recommendations? It's no, it, we can impose discipline ranging from a letter. So that is separate and apart from what the agency might impose. So the agency might, in, in, as part of their internal affairs investigation, send a package that says, here's the investigation. We know it's going to go to the council. Subcommittee looks at it. It goes to the full council. They may impose whatever that might be, uh, ranging from a letter all the way to dismissal. We have kind of a similar menu. Uh, if it comes to the full council, we can uh, do things ranging from a letter all the way to decertification, which is the ultimate punishment. And it's, it's right, you lose your right and your ability forever to, uh, to operate and serve as a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont. Al Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to share a, a brief story. And it really, um, I think, um, supports your point, Bill, about the need for having recruits with high IQ and EQ. Um, the executive director of the National Office of League and Cities and Towns um, came to Vermont. And he flew into Burlington, ran out of car, and was on his way to Montpelier. So on his way, he had an important phone call. So he pulled over on the shoulder and took the call. And moments later, he saw blue lights coming towards him, pulled right behind him. So you can imagine his blood pressure goes up. He's like, oh, stuff. What's, you know, here we go. And the officer walked up to him and said, can I help you? He was on his way to a meeting to decide whether or not they were going to have their, their national meeting here in Vermont. That sold him. It makes all the difference. So thank you. Thanks, Hal. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Bill, you just talked about the ultimate uh, uh, form of discipline being the removal of your certification. Um, I know it's a different department. Does that bleed over into people who used to be a cop, getting a PI, arm PI license, anything like that through Secretary of State's or anything? Is that a, is there a nexus there at all? Not that I'm aware of uh, at this current time. I think it's just uh, based upon purely on the certification to be a law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont. Does not have any tie into uh, being a private investigator or similar duties. Have an opinion on the, the appropriateness of that? Uh, um, I haven't thought of it. Uh, you, I think you can already uh, sense where I come from on all of this, but I don't know how you would make that nexus and how you would enforce it. Um, so I, at this current time, I, I don't know enough about those, those processes and how they would tie in. Well, it's kind of like I see it as one step away from, and maybe it's not a big enough step. Bill, can I solicit your opinion? Uh, you asking this, Bill? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good question for the Secretary of State. Uh, I have no idea what the criteria are for licensing for uh, uh, PIs and whether there are different licenses for different things that they propose to do. So uh, uh, I think I'm in the Bill Sheets camp that uh, if you are lacking such and behaved in such ways that you shouldn't be a law enforcement officer, uh, depending on what a PI is being asked to do, you might not be well qualified uh, or even minimally qualified to do that. But uh, again, I'd ask uh, either, uh, either the Secretary of State or uh, the fellow who runs the licensing part of that operation to, to talk about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Tanya. 
Thank you. Um, if someone is sort of an addendum to that, if someone's decertified in the state of Vermont, are they able to cross state lines and get certified in another state? I think technically they would be. I would hope that the hiring agency would know that they came from a position in Vermont and would be well aware that they were decertified here. I think it would depend. Uh, I guess the answer is, I certainly hope they wouldn't be hired in a different state if they were decertified anywhere in the country. And there is, by the way, there is talk, right, of doing some type of national database. And some states do have kind of a consortium amongst at least neighboring states where they share a database. Uh, but we have that public facing registry now. And I think at least for decertifications, when you Google somebody's name, I think it's going to be easy to find that they're, they're de decertified in Vermont. So technically, I think they could be hired in another state, but uh, God, I hope not. On the National Decertification Index um, that's on the web, we're actually one of 11 states that puts those names forward. So that is available to anyone who checks that index. Um, it's with the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training called IATALUS. They have an, a National Decertification Index that they have and we participate in that. Thanks, Cindy. Any other questions from committee members? Well, I have to say this has been a, a really good conversation this morning and I thank the three of you for, uh, for coming to spend so much time with us um, to give us a, a snapshot of where the council is right now. Um, it gives me great hope for, uh, for the future that, that so many of the changes that we put into statute last year are being embraced and, um, and acted on uh, wholeheartedly by the sounds of it. So thank you so much for all of your work and any, anyone got any parting thoughts that they'd like to leave us with? Uh, I, on behalf of the three of us, thank you for this opportunity. And I'd suggest that uh, uh, maybe Maybe next session for that a couple of the other of the governor's appointees, maybe uh, uh, you, you should ask them how they're finding their experiences and are we doing what you envision when you set up uh, the council? That is an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll take the time to do that, I'm sure. Um, so I guess for the benefit of the folks who may be watching from outside of this Zoom room, um, I wanna welcome you to stay in touch with the members of this committee, um, to share your thoughts with us um, uh, via email or to request a virtual meeting if that would work better for you. Uh, this has been, um, uh, this has been a long conversation and one that we have attempted very intentionally to have um, with members of our communities in Vermont, all members of our communities. And so uh, if you're tuning in on this and you have thoughts or reactions, um, please don't hesitate to look us up on the legislative website and share your thoughts with us. So thank you, Bill and Bill and Cindy. For, for the great uh, conversation this morning and um, we will see you again. Thank you. It's good. So committee, that is it for us for this morning. We are back again this afternoon, um, 15 minutes after the floor. So I will um, let you all go, get, uh, get stretch your legs, go for a walk maybe some fresh air if it's not too cold out and see you back on the floor and then in committee after that.